the Pirate Handbook, written by Pat Croce. We did the introduction called Avast Ye, and now then, <coughs> excuse me, Chapter 1, Preparations and Provisions. We are waiting for you with pleasure, and I have powder and ball with which to receive you. Henry Morgan, <coughs> who they ended up naming a rum after when he's a captain. Becoming a sea devil is not a decision to be taken lightly. Countless perils await, many of which will send you to Davy Jones's locker long before your time. However, for those who throw caution to the wind, sign the articles and sail under the black flag, a life of action and adventure and possibly great fortune is sure to follow. Still, before you cross the gangplank and come aboard, you'll be wise to equip yourself with the specialized accoutrement and requisite skills for your chosen career. Space is at a minimum. You're not captain yet. No private cabin in your immediate future. Whatever you can pack into your duffel will have to suffice. Thus, you need to pack wisely. Necessities, not luxuries. Pirate ships are cramped enough. Besides, you'll find more than enough plunder aboard your first prize. Proper clothing is your first priority. Layers are the key. Better to have them and not need them than need them and not have them. Add or subtract based on what Mother Nature throws at you. At the bare minimum, this means a sturdy pair of canvas pants, a loose-fitting cotton top, Long sleeves are best for sun protection, and an overcoat that is both wind and water resistant. Mm -hmm. Add in appropriate undergarments, and you've got a multi-use outfit that will get you just about anywhere. When it comes to footwear, sailors don't have many choices. In some cases, there's no choice at all, especially if they've been press-ganged or conscripted, which is forced into service. For these poor souls, the British Navy hands out slops, simple canvas doublets, breeches, cotton waistcoats, and drawers, stockings, linen shirts, knitted wool caps, and run-of-the-mill shoes. Not only don't these garments fit particularly well when dry, but when soaked with water or sweat or salt water, which is often, wearing them is akin to punishment trying to perform arduous chores in a marine environment, or worse, engaging in life-or-death naval combat while wearing clothes that are too tight, too loose, too, or uncomfortable to the point of uh, distraction is at least a nuisance, and at worst, a serious handicap. For this reason, when the weather is warm, crewmen usually go about bare-chested. I recommend you do the same. A little side thing here, Motley Crew. This term came about to describe the multicolored ensembles pirates wore, representing the wide varieties of clothing plundered from various sources throughout their voyages. The more ferocious you look, the less you have to fight. When pirates go into battle, they go loaded for bear. But some take their arsenal and imagery to another level. Blackbeard routinely wore a bandolier-like sling across his blood-red brocaded coat, which held a triple brace of pistols. A well-used cutlass and a dagger were tucked into his belt. His long black beard was tied with ribbons, and his scraggly black hair was interwoven with slow-burning cannon fuses. When lit, cast a smoky haze around his head, making him appear like a demon direct from Hades. The very sight of him often caused enemies to surrender without a struggle rather than chance dancing with the devil. All right, moving on. But fear not. The sooner you turn from merchant or naval service to piracy, the sooner you can amass a proper wardrobe. Canvas, cotton, silk, velvet. We pirates adorn ourselves in a vast array of fabrics and colors accumulated from a wide variety of passengers, many of whom were wealthy from all sorts of cultures and nationalities. A word of caution. Function is far more valuable than form. If it's comfortable and serves its purpose, it will be preferred over the most lavish finery. But that doesn't mean we pirates don't have a sense of style. Quite the contrary. Clothes worn aboard the ship for work and for battle differ significantly from what we wear ashore during our 
shall we say, leisure time pursuits. As such, any items of finery or fashion are usually reserved for our more pleasurable on-island activities. After all, we aren't called gentlemen of fortune for nothing. This mentality applies to all but the captains, who are almost always regally, and in some cases flamboyantly, attired. From their colorful waistcoats and sashes to impressive tri-cornered hats, often festooned with exotic bird feathers, to an abundant adornment of gold and silvery jewelry. Pirate captains have an image to uphold, and the lavishness of their wardrobe often correlates to how much respect they command. By far, the pirate most notorious for his impressive attire was Black Bart Roberts, a snazzy dresser. Roberts routinely went into battle wearing a crimson damask waistcoat and breeches with a red feather in his cap and a large diamond cross plundered booty originally intended for the King of Portugal, hanging around his neck. Not all pirate captains subscribe to the image is everything mindset. However, some intentionally wear less than stellar outfits, simple waistcoats, and long sea coats, for example, to pass themselves off as officers on a privateer or merchant ship in an effort to fool any watchful eyes peering through a prey ship's spyglass. Ah, uh, there are some clever minds in our ranks. Proper pirate attire. Oversized golden loop earrings. Pirates, especially some of the fancier, more flamboyant captains, can often be seen with large gold hoop earrings dangling from their lobes. Obvious signs of wealth and success, there is an added benefit. The, pr the pressure they apply to the lobes, especially the heavier earrings, helps modulate equili equilibrium and will ease or eliminate seasickness. And if you die penniless, you can always bribe your way into Fiddler's Green, it's a sailor's paradise, with your last bit of jewelry. The infamous eye patch. Pirates don't wear eye patches because it makes them look mean or cool. Fragments of gunpowder from muskets or flintlocks destroy innumerable eyes, as do flying silvers, slivers of sharp wood from cannonball strikes to the gun walls. And then there are the shipboard combat uh, injuries, whether due to pistol, pistol and musket balls or cutlass and dagger slashes and thrusts. But eye damage frequently occurs under less harrowing circumstances. Prolonged staring into the harsh sun while using a cross staff, which spurred the development of the back staff, can render an eye just as blind. Scarves and sashes. Besides being an obvious fashion statement, scarves and sashes have a wide variety of uses. They can conceal small pistols and daggers, or even act as slings or holders for those very same weapons. They can be ripped into wadding for the firing of flintlocks and muskets, <clears throat> and if battle goes against you, they can be used as bandages or tourniquets. What's more, long, loose pieces of cloth can also be used as weapons, both offensive and defensive. You can defend against dagger and cutlass strikes, catch or imprison limbs, choke and constrict, or tie to a heavy object to use as a flail. But make sure they are secured in such a fashion so as not to be a liability during work or battle. And how to tie a man down. Whether being used to keep hair out of your face, keep the sun off your head, reduce your body temperature after being soaked in cold water, or simply make you look cool when swashbuckling, bandanas are invaluable. Start by stealing a square of fabric, I, uh, yeah, ideally 24 inches square or larger, lay it flat, fold in half as to make a triangle, position lowest edge against your forehead at the height of your choosing, Pull side corners toward the back of your head and tie a single knot on top of the middle point. Bandana should be firmly tied but not uncomfortable. And then adjust tightness by pulling on the bottom corner flap and tightening knot in the back. I think the chapter is fairly long. I will cause that, we will do it in parts. So that'd be part one. Long enough. That means 
We'll do uh, chapter one, part two, next. I need some rum. Make sure to subscribe to my channel. And that way you'll know if you like this when the next part arrives.